Our next uh, speaker is Chiyap, and he will be talking about novel range functions via Lagrange interpolation with application to root isolation uh, when you want. Okay. Um, let me see. Okay, can I begin? Uh, yes. Okay, well, um, I'd like to thank uh, you and the other organizers for organizing a great session here and for inviting me to give a talk. Um, I'd like to say that this paper will appear in Isaac, which is happening right now, this week. And uh, tomorrow morning, my co-author, uh, Kai Hallman will present um, this talk at um, at Isaac. Um, so, uh, okay. Um, well, if if you attend that talk, it won't be exactly the same. So, so he prepared his slides a little different from mine. So there's a lot of overlap, obviously. But but in case you would like to attend it, I think it's early nine a.m. tomorrow morning. Okay, so this talk is about, uh, well, my co-authors, as I mentioned, is uh, Kai Hallman and uh, Lucas Kania at USI in Lugano, Switzerland. Um, so uh, novel range functions and root isolations, those are the two topics that, um, that we're gonna talk about. So those are the two problems I'll briefly mention, introduce them. And then I'll talk about the CL framework, C L. Cornelius Lohman, Lohner um, to understand um, the class of range functions in which we are operating in. And then uh, I'll talk about a root isolation algorithm called EVEL. Uh, now EVEL should not be a stranger to this audience if you have followed the um, earlier talk by Alperin. Um, EVEL is really the one dimensional version of the PV algorithm. In fact, uh, I was so struck by the PV algorithm when I learned about it that I decided, well, why don't we go down from two dimensions to one dimension and see what we can do with it. And I've been playing around with it for a while. So this is the EVEL algorithm. And then we'll do some empirical comparison um, of our range functions in the context of uh, EVEL algorithm. And then I'll conclude. Okay. Um, so throughout this talk, you can more or less fix a real function f from r to r. And we are going to consider two problems, p1 and p2. p1 is the range problem for f. That is to compute a function that I call box f, which goes from box r to box r. So box r is the set of compact intervals of a uh, real interval obviously, and um, to compact real intervals. And um, it is called a range function if it includes the exact range. So here's an illustration of this idea. If F is this, the graph of F is shown here uh, in this picture here, and uh, I is this green interval, then its exact range is determined by the maxima and local maxima and local minima in this graph. And so we indicate it by this red interval, vertical interval, f of i, that's the exact range. But of course the exact range is expensive to compute and probably not worth doing because it, it would involve doing root isolation or determining local maximas and minimas as shown in this picture. So instead we compute uh, a box function, which is a superset of the exact function. So that's what we mean by range function in this talk. And the second problem that we consider P2 is what is called a root isolation problem for F uh, on an interval I. So if I give an interval I, I want to find all the roots of F on the interval I and by finding all the roots, I mean for each root in the interval i, I want to find an isolating interval. 
And isolating interval means that the interval should contain exactly one root. Uh, for instance, uh, on the left here, uh, you see this, uh, the first green interval contains one root. So that's a good isolating interval. The second one is also an isolating interval, contains one root. The third one is also good. The fourth one, which is a red interval, contains no root, so that's no good. And the fifth one contains two in roots, so it's also not an isolating interval. Okay, so that's a problem of root isolation. Now let's um, just briefly review some basic facts about root range functions. Uh, it is a fundamental tool for all interval methods. Uh, you can't do anything in interval methods or certified computation without interval methods. And um, the usual uh, assumption is that f of i, the exact range, has to be contained in box f of i. Uh, that's called the inclusion property. But really, a, a hidden assumption, which is, uh, of course, normally uh, um, satisfied, is that in the limit, the box function will um, converge onto the actual value of the function on a point if the sequence of intervals i sub i converges to a single point. So when we say box function, we really mean any function that satisfies these two properties, inclusion and convergence. Um, now, there are many kinds of range functions, uh, but most of them actually uh, arises from Taylor expansions. Um, so here are two functions. Uh, the way we distinguish the different range functions or box functions is we put superscripts or subscripts or, or tilde as indicated here. Uh, these two notations that I'm showing here uh, are what I will call the minimal and maximal Taylor forms of F. Uh, of the subscript two tells us that this is order two convergence. Um, we'll give us more precise definition below. Now, given that there are many, uh, the box functions are not unique, so how do we evaluate them and decide what is better? Obviously, uh, uh, one way to compare two box functions is the, how tight they are. We want them to be as tight as possible. Um, unfortunately, uh, it, there's a trade-off involved because the tighter functions may involve more computation and it's less efficient to compute. So there's this efficient efficiency tightness trade-off. And most papers, as far as we know, uh, evaluate these range functions in isolation in the absence of any actual computation. So you can talk about how good or how tight it is and how efficient it is, but what, what about the trade-off? Um, and that really depends on the application. And so we are going to combine these two in uh, uh, study this trade-off. And I, I call this holistic evaluation. So this is a table from our paper. Um, this table has got uh, uh, 19 rows. Each row corresponds to a polynomial. For instance, the first polynomial is T sub 20, that's Chebyshev 20. The, the subscript 20 says that this is degree 20. And the last polynomial S sub 800 says that this is a sparse polynomial of degree 800. Um, and then we're going to test each of these root isolation uh, of these polynomials on various intervals, i sub zero, uh, for the first bunch of Chebyshev polynomials, uh, where you testing, uh, doing root isolation from minus 10 to, to plus 10, and so on. And then you, what follows are eight different columns. Each column corresponds to an implementation of the eval algorithm using different range functions, different box functions. And finally, the last column called sigma is the speed up ratio. And the speed up is the ratio between the timing of the blue column divided by the timing of the green column. Um, and you see that the speed up is all greater than one, which means that the green column is faster by that factor, the first for the first ball is 1.8 times faster and so on. Now, now the first two columns, the, the blue 
and the green and, and the red uh, corresponds respectively to the minimal um, Taylor form of order two uh, and the maximal Taylor form. And as you can see, the grip, the minimal Taylor form uh, did not converge or has blanks. That means that they time out after one hour running. Uh, so it really doesn't work very well um, compared to the maximal. And so the first message of this table is that the order of convergence is really not enough of a criteria to decide whether a method is good, on, a, a, a range function or a box function is good or not. Because both of the, the red and the blue both have order two. Um, and the green column is what in this uh, family of eight uh, box functions is what we call our favorite. Uh, it's favorite because it's um, oh, is essentially the fastest, uh, not really the fastest, but it's quite close. The fastest is really the last column, um, this E sub four super L prime. So the subscript of the E's, uh, E sub two, E sub two, that means order two. And so the highest order convergence, or fourth order convergence. And in every row, you will see a underline. Uh, like for instance, this underline here tells you that this is the fastest um, timing for, for this polynomial um, among all the eight um, methods. And generally speaking, you see that the fourth order method uh, wins eventually over the third order method, which is our favorite. Uh, yet we call this our favorite because it's easy to implement compared to the fourth order. Um, and so, so we're basically going to favor this fourth order in our discussion. Uh, and the blue column essentially is state of the art because until our introduction of these um, Lagrange forms, the superscript L reference to Lagrange range functions, uh, I think everybody uses Taylor form. Um, uh, even though the, the, in principle, these uh, Lagrange type um, uh, range functions ha have been introduced in the CL uh, setting. As far as I know, no serious implementation has ever been done to, uh, or to evaluate them. And, and so, so this blue column really represents state of the art if you want to implement range functions. Um, so feel free to interrupt and ask any questions you have. Um, so this tells us that range order of convergence is not enough. And the second table combined with the first table, the next table here is um, the second table uh, tells us the size of the eval subdivision tree. So eval is a subdivision algorithm. You begin with a single uh, interval, I0, and then you keep subdividing them. So that forms a binary tree. Um, and the size of this tree, it will terminate when eventually you can either decide that an interval does not contain a root or it's an isolating interval. And so the size of this table is directly proportional to the tightness of um, the range method. So if you, again, for, in every row, you'll see a, a, an underline indicating it's the best, uh, the tightest method. So for instance, T20, the first row, you see that uh, ET sub four, uh, ET is eval, uh, T is Taylor, and sub four is order four. So this has the best, um, is, has the tightest um, uh, range uh, bound, bound, uh, bound on the range, on the exact range. And in fact, it is the best on the entire um, column. Uh, and yet you find that in terms of speed, it is our favorite that beats the, this uh, tightest one. So that, that illustrates the uh, efficiency tightness trade-off. And there's no way we can understand this trade-off without an explicit application like say root isolation. So I found this to be very instructive. Um, for instance, uh, the fact that uh, usually people just 
take the minimal Taylor um, range function and, and think, oh, this, this is uh, uh, good enough because there's uh, second order convergence. And, and generally people think that second order is really as good as any, uh, really shows that it's really not very good unless you go for the maximal form. Uh, in theory, we had some suspicion this has already, this is true because in our theoretical analysis showing that eval is near optimal, we, we had to use uh, the, the maximal Taylor forms. Um, and this empirical study really confirms that, that the minimal form is not a proof, but the minimum form is probably not optimal. I, well, I won't say it's not optimal, but it, it's so far off that it's not even worth considering in practice. Okay. Um, so, so the trade-off in is illustrated by this picture. This table is that the fourth order Taylor, which is the purple column, is always the tightest, but it's not the fastest. The fastest is indicated. Well, this is usually the fastest. This is the fourth order Lagrange. L prime means there's a variant in our implementation there. Uh, the fourth order here is the fastest generally, but it's not far off from our favorite. So, okay, so, so a mini summary of what this talk will be about is that I'll talk a little bit more about what is the CL framework, Cornelius Lohner framework, in which we can discuss all these uh, range functions and then to discuss, give a little bit more detail about our uh, experimental evaluation. Okay, the CL framework. So let's begin with something that is probably familiar with most, to, to most people who, who, who have looked at the interval literature. Uh, this is basically classic. Uh, you, I'll call this Taylor forms of order two uh, we introduce another parameter besides two called the level, level n. So if your interval i is a, b with midpoint m, uh, then the Taylor form of order two level n evaluated on i is given by this formula. So the part, the, the two terms here that I call exact uh, is evaluating the function at the midpoint, evaluating the de derivative at the midpoint, and multiplying by i minus m. Since m is the interval, is the midpoint of i, i minus m is very special. It's a centered interval. And basically, all, all that it does is converts, the, it puts an uh, absolute value sign on that f prime. That, that's roughly speaking what it does. Uh, plus, this is the exact part. That's because this is linear and this is, well, a, a single number. Uh, uh, this linear function on an interval uh, is easy to determine exactly. Uh, you just have to evaluate the function on the endpoints and that's the interval. But this part is what we call approximate. This is the remainder part. This is the exact part, remainder part. And the, the remainder part is approximate because uh, here i goes from 2 to n minus 1. And again, here's the centered intervals raised to the i. That's not a problem. And uh, this, this is the i derivative. So this is points. Um, but these are all approximations. Uh, they're, they're not exact. Uh, because once your function is nonlinear, then, then uh, it's not exactly determined by the endpoints, or it's not easy to compute. And finally, there's one term, which is the nth derivative. Now we, we have a box function of the nth derivative evaluated on i, and then we take its magnitude. And this is an interval evaluation. Look, uh, all the other terms are point evaluations, but this is the only interval evaluation. So this is what we call uh, level n order two Taylor form. And maximal and minimal simply means n is equal to two, which means that we, we basically don't have this, this term and only have this, uh, this interval evaluation in a minimal case. And in a maximal case, in case n is, f is a polynomial of degree n, 
and uh, then this becomes a constant. So, so, so you only have these terms and not this interval evaluation, and that's called the maximal form. Uh, well, in principle, you can go to infinity, um, but you have to bound it by some other means. Okay, so they both have order n, uh, order two convergence, regardless of the level. But what the previous uh, tables that I showed it uh, concerning the minimal and maximal is that order of convergence is not the only story. And the reason it is so intuitively is because each of these extra terms is converging to zero uh, with higher and higher order. Uh, the ith term is converging at order i. So the, this approximate part is going to zero extremely fast in the maximal case. And this is very important in practice. And this is exactly what is explained by the CL framework. So let me go to the CL framework. So in the CL framework, um, if you give me any function g from r to r, view g as an approximation to f, actually g is going to depend on the input interval uh, in, in, in all the examples. Uh, but given any function g, uh, I can define a, a box function for f by evaluating g on an interval exact. And I, I have to compute this exactly. So I call this the exact part plus a box function on the remainder. So f minus g is the remainder. And now I put a box around it, meaning that I'm going to approximate it. Uh, and I have to evaluate on an interval i. And the theorem, fairly easy to prove from CL, is that um, this box function f has the same order of convergence as the remainder part, which is box of f minus g. Now, the fact that g of i has to be exact uh, kind of limits application of this theory to uh, low degree polynomials. Uh, CL mentioned that maybe five or six is the limit of what you can do in here. So given that framework, how do we choose G to achieve any given order of convergence K? Now you have to remember that until uh, the CL paper, I think uh, interval peoples work very hard to, to produce order of convergence greater than two, k greater than two. And there might be examples of k equals three or something, but there's no general framework to do beyond second order convergence. So, so this, this theory is actually very nice. It, it introduced a whole new class of um, methods, range functions in interval analysis. Um, and CL, recommends using the Hermit interpolation scheme uh, of type, let's say K comma L. K is the order convergence and L is the level. L is at least K. Uh, so you, just to quickly recall in the Hermit interpolation on an interval, uh, I choose, uh, let's say L plus one points, say X zero, X one to XL. And at each, the ith point I associate an integer p sub i. And, and basically this says that I want my function g. Remember, I'm trying to define this function, this interpolating function g. I want the, the, the derivatives of g at the point xi uh, for, for derivatives from 0 to pi minus 1 to equal the derivatives of f evaluated at xi. Um, and here, here are two examples uh, where k is equal, kl is four comma zero. So l equals zero means we only have one point. So this is basically representing Taylor form. This is Taylor form of order four. Four is just the sum. Uh, uh, so, so it has to match the, the derivative, the zero der derivative up to the third derivative at the center of the interval. And this is, the Lagrange form where each of the um, uh, PIs are equal to one. So that's what we mean by the Lagrange form. And, and both of them are fourth order uh, methods uh, according to the theory we just described here, according to this theory. 
um, but which one is better? And what we'll show is that the Lagrange form has speed advantages over um, Taylor form. Uh, in this will come out a little bit later. So, um, so the Taylors. Uh, so the remainder part can be written in this way. This is from standard theory of uh, Hermit interpolation. Um, and given this formula I call equation star, uh, you can derive um, range functions for the remainder. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to focus mainly on Lagrangian scheme on three points. Uh, so the three points on an interval a, b is a, b, and m. This is the natural choice of three points uh, with radius r. And it's easy to compute that if you interpolate, uh, do the Lagrange interpolation on i on three points, you get this quadric, quadratic polynomial in x. Uh, uh, and to compute it, you have to evaluate f at a, f at b, and f at m. So, and since this is a quadratic polynomial, uh, we assume that we can compute this g of i exactly. So we are all set to go in applying the CL theory. And for the um, evaluation of the remainder part, uh, we see that the remainder function and the interval i is contained in the absolute or the magnitude of the omega function. Omega function is a standard um, error. Um, I'm not sure what the name for it is, but omega is a fairly standard notation of i, uh, magnitude of omega of i, and then the magnitude of the third derivative of f on the interval i, all these are numbers, and then you multiply this by the interval minus plus or minus one. So this creates an interval and this is an inclusion. So technically, if you can compute this, you can compute the range function. But of course, this function you cannot compute exactly. So you have to approximate it further. And we're going to give a recursive formula for computing this. Um, uh, this part turns out to be exactly easy to evaluate exactly. Uh, it's square root of three over 27 r cubed. So the main interest is how do you bound this one? And in the minimal form, you just use any interval method to evaluate this. But as you know, uh, as you suspect from our previous picture uh, table, uh, that's probably not going to work very well, the minimal form. So we really want to continue to higher and higher derivatives. But how do we do it in this framework? Uh, it turns out that uh, if you had to bound the absolute value of f to the third derivative on the interval i, you can now apply the Lagrange interpolant again on the same points. Uh, let's call it the Lagrange interpolating polynomial to be g1 this time. And then the same omega pops up times f to the sixth of i, the, the magnitude of this interval. And f to the six, well, you can again apply the same thing after j, after the jth term, and the very last. In the very last term, when you stop at j, uh, we will actually use a interval, um, a range fu function on f to the three j, and so, after, when you telescope this, this gives our Lagrange form. Or recursive Lagrange form uh, of, or, of order three and level n. And when n, you set n to infinity, that is what we call the maximal Lagrange form. And if you set it equal to three, you have the minimal form and we won't even look at the minimal form. We'll just look at the maximal. Okay, so, so that's what we call the, the Lagrange form. Uh, we have two predicates. Um, 
C0 and C1. And I put a box around it because this is only a test. Sergi. Yeah? Yeah, so we are out of time actually. Okay, so I will go to the we, uh, conclusion. Yeah, if you can wrap up really fast because we are five minutes uh, out of we time We have now. the um, uh, introduced new recursive Lagrangian with unique advantages. Uh, I think I should mention what the unique advantage is. When you evaluate an interval uh, using our new Lagrangian method, you have to evaluate uh, derivatives, n over three derivatives at A, n over three derivatives at B, and n over three derivatives at C. So total number of evaluation is n uh, evaluations. And this is no different than the maximal Taylor form. But remember that in subdivision, except for the root for the initial interval, all subsequent intervals already have all the evaluations at the left and n right endpoint. So you only need about n over three evaluations at the midpoint. So right off, you expect a speed up of three. So that, that's a reason why uh, we explored this and, and did this experiment to show that the unique advantages of this method. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions.